Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to today's On the Agenda webinar organised by the European Liberal Forum. My name is Lauren Mason, and for those of you who might not know ELF yet, um, we are the think tank and the political foundation of the European Liberals. We're working very closely with the ALDI party and 47 member organisations across Europe. Today, in our On the Agenda webinar, we're going to be looking at the question of digital green certificates and whether that's a way to get us out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we know that there are some concerns about discrimination and how these, vac these vaccination certificates might be put into place. Um, but we realise this might be our only way out and uh, a chance to return to normality. So those are the questions that we'll be looking at this afternoon. We're joined by two excellent speakers and our moderator, Sam Morgan. So without any further ado, Sam, I'd like to hand over the floor to you to take away the discussion. Many thanks, Lauren. Thank you to everyone tuning in as well. Indeed, today we're going to be talking about a possible solution to our lockdown pandemic lives at the moment. Digital green certificates, they're essentially vaccine passports, but don't let any EU officials let them hear you say that because it's a bit of a jargon filled uh, term, which we'll get into, of course. Um, they recently, the Commission recently issued this proposal about a digital vaccine passport, uh, which would allow people to start uh, traveling more freely during summer 2021. Uh, it would essentially mean that anyone who's had an EMA approved vaccine can travel freely between countries that are part of this scheme uh, if you've had negative tests or if you've recently recovered from the virus. Um, this of course all sounds very good. A lot of countries are obviously very reliant on tourism as part of their GDP. And of course you could also argue that this is somewhat of a mental health issue. We all need a summer break, right? Uh, but that's another issue we'll get into. Um, but can it work? Will it work? Is this actually a solution to our current problem? Um, is the pandemic stage that we're at the moment too delicate for us even to consider something like this? Can we compare something like Israel to the European Union in terms of complexities? Uh, we have two very distinguished guests to help us delve into this issue. It's a really broad one. We've only got an hour to get into it, but let's see what kind of different perspectives and even solutions we can bring into this. Uh, the first of our uh, speakers today is uh, Dr. Elena Petalos. Welcome, Elena. Uh, she is Vice President for Health Technology Assessment at the European Public Health Association. Uh, Dr. Petalos is a lecturer in evidence-based medicine and evidence-informed policy at the University of Crete. Welcome, Elena. I'm gonna hand the floor over to you first uh, for your opening statement about vaccine passports. You've obviously worked with this issue quite a lot. Tell us about how you see this, the commission proposal, and um, is it a solution at the moment, or are we getting ahead of ourselves, putting the uh, cart before the horse? Over to you, Elena. Um, thank you, Sam. Thank you for the kind invite to you for two. Um, First of all, to say that this, uh, you use the term immunity or immunization passports. The actual term for the, for the commission's proposal is green pass. And we're suffering a little bit from semantic ambiguity because we have seen different term, terms, you know, like vaccination certificate, a vaccination pass, immunity or immunization pass, and so on. And perhaps the dilemmas are the same in all of these cases, but um, they, they do mean different things. I mean, a passport is a cross-border control, a pass is not a passport, and so on. So we started discussing this, um, this topic uh, in anticipation uh, that it may become a proposed solution last March. And we convened a group uh, to debate the topic in October in the World um, Conference of Public Health, which was collocated with the European Public Health Conference this year. At the time, the German, um, in Germany, we have had ethics committees saying that this should not happen for equitable reasons, access reasons, and so on. We tried to be um, practical in the sense of we invited people that could give us the technical interoperability aspect, the scientific limitations that we have, or in terms of uncertainty, what we know, what we do not know. But also we wanted to have, of course, as public health uh, specialists, the ethical dimension and the legal dimension there. Um, what the commission has proposed, this is a proposal for regulation of the European Parliament and of the Council, is a digital green certificate. Um, which makes it an explicit reference solely to the coronavirus disease, it's only to COVID-19 or to other diseases. And um, the interoperable certificates for vaccination are not a new topic. We have been discussing and many of us working on them for, for over a decade. Um, the proposal is a proposal by DigiConnect, not by DigiSante. Uh, um, and indeed, um, 
it, it is true that it's vaccination certificate uh, and ensuring we know the vaccination status of people moving across border is, is a right that people have. They need to know and they have the right to know the vaccination status and to be uh, able to be afforded the right cross-border care should they cross a border. I mean, we already have people moving across borders and we're discussing where they can be given and whether they can be given a second shot um, of, of a vaccine or of the same vaccine after having moved across a border. Um, according to the Commission, this is an effort um, not pertaining, strictly speaking, to third countries, but only to EU member states, which may be implementing disparate and fragmented measures, um, for example, testing prior to travel or quarantine or self-isolation. Um, and of course, we acknowledge that this is a, a major issue for particularly for those crossing borders to work, to care for family uh, or um, uh, for, for other reasons. And th those living in uh, border areas have been particularly affected. So um, we have had by October 2020, the council recommendation for the coordinated approach to the restriction of free movement. And most of you probably have seen these little maps uh, with a color coding of regions by ECDC, which was on, from a practical perspective, it was introducing thresholds in terms of movement on the basis of the level of risk of transmission in those areas. The proposal is complementary to this effort. Um, so what I would try to do is, is um, mention a few things very briefly about what we see um, uh, as potential things to, to, to address uh, for, for such a thing to be considered. The arguments why this is needed in the, in the regulatory proposal are that the certificates um, in terms of reason of scale and effects of asking can be better achieved by the EU level. Um, and that if nothing is done uh, and there's no agreement on technical standards to ensure interoperability, then um, we will have further limitation to citizens exercising the free right movement. So uh, arguably we do have some issues um, which probably Jews would better address because the proposal does not appear to take into um, great consideration um, um, the need for an impact assessment for GDPR and also for public health issues. I think the reason that is mentioned is um, a limitation of time for an impact assessment, but we would argue that this is a health technology um, and needs to be assessed as such. So from a, from a scientific perspective, the issues that pertain um, to the proposal and should be addressed is we have some uncertainty on the threshold of immunity, which is considered adequate and on establishing what that threshold is. We still have some uncertainty on the rate of waning immunity so in layman's terms, the drop of antibodies over time, or simply the extent to which the body's immune system is able to effectively combat the infection. We have a um, critical topic, I think, which people have uh, become accustomed to discussing, unfortunately, in the last three months, that of variants. Um, so we, we know that the, some degree of protection is conferred, but as new variants are emerging, we don't know how that will be impacted. Um, and knowing that the certificate is also one of having had the disease, you know, because it's immunity status, not only vaccination status, we're not quite sure what new types of disease will mean in terms of, of um, high risk practices. So um, also for more practical terms, um, although the vaccinated person may still get infected exactly because of this vaccination, may experience the disease with very mild symptoms or even no symptoms. So subclinical, if you like, uh, we call that subclinical uh, disease. So there's no real manifestation. We know that the person is also less infectious in those cases, but still there is a, a risk of infection. So we would argue that the, the best strategy is to maximize vaccination uh, when you have limited resources, particularly because of this reason. And there, there are the two issues that we, we had discussed and we're revisiting now, additionally to equity and so on. Um, administrative remedies if a European citizen is refused access to EU territory, because we think that may pop up. Um, an alternative act for people not having access, alternative passage um, uh, or pathways um, for people not having uh, vaccine, access to vaccines because of coverage. Um, we do think that to say, I mean, we have heard this, it's not in this proposal, is the argument of incentivizing people to vaccinate. At the moment, we have a, an experience of supply demand uh, reverse. So, I mean, we don't think that is quite a, a key point. Um, and to, uh, to, to illustrate an additional concern, because this, the, the more um, granular you get, the more complicated it gets. Um, there's been intense debate, as you may know, on the dosing regimens. How much time do we leave between the two doses? 
We have had in the past few days, the preliminary results of a couple of studies, the SOAP study from King's and Francis Creek Institute, and then in the antibody responses at week three following the first dose of the vaccine were only 39% in the solid and 13% in the hematological cancers compared to 97% to those without cancer. So in other words, the people um, which are, if you like, immunocompromised, we have the cancer you plan running in Europe are at double risk and at the same time we probably have to be penalized because what are you going to do? You're going to adapt the duration of the immunization certificate or you're not going to give them one. Um, so the dosing intervals are being re-examined at the moment uh, for Pfizer-BioNTech um, for cancer patients and other high-risk groups of immunosuppressed patients. So we believe we should expand the dialogue to that effect. Um, I think um, we have also some other practical considerations for public health. Public health is not only the medical aspect. Um, for example, the young people will be the last to be vaccinated, the young healthy people. So limiting their movement is an issue to consider. And from a perspective of tourism and so on, um, people travel usually in their families. So children at the moment are not candidates for vaccination. So they may be getting some sort of certification, but we're not sure you know, what validity that would have in terms of avoiding risk. Last but not least, something that we've started looking and we, we will be releasing both a detailed statement and a, and a couple of, of reviews we've been doing is if you say to people, we, we leave measures as is, and please continue having adherence to non-pharmaceutical um, pharmacological interventions. And then at the same time, you say, this is a passport, you are, you are you know, free to move uh, and safe to move. The message is a little bit uh, mixed, if you like. So we are a little bit concerned. We've seen it already about how people start behaving, how they perceive the risk and how they start behaving in terms of what they consider to be essential travel. Uh, we've seen that in last summer, I think, but this year, because of the variants, it's a little bit riskier. Thank you. Thanks for raising those points, Elena. There's plenty of those that I think we can really come back to in the Q&A. Uh, before I introduce our second speaker, just to everyone watching at home, I assume you're all at home, um, there's a Q&A function in the Zoom chat where obviously you can ask your questions as well. We'd ask you to follow the house rules and put your name and uh, obviously keep things civil. Please do that. Um, our second speaker today is uh, Ben Butters. He's CEO of Eurosham, which is the eyes, ears and voice of Europe's business community. Uh, welcome, Ben. I'm going to hand the floor over to you now uh, for your sort of opening statement on this about vaccine passports, digital green certificates, um, how we get the economy back up and running to some extent. I think we're all pretty aware that businesses are having an extremely tough time at the moment. Um, give us your perspective on this whole issue. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for the introduction and thanks to Lauren as well for her opening remarks and to Elena for her uh, very insightful comments about, um, about the, the proposal um, and the, the, the possible the, the benefits and possible pitfalls in that, in that process, which is really, really very interesting. Um, as, you, as you said towards the end of your remarks, Sam, I think we do all know that business has been suffering, but nonetheless, I, I, I want to um, give you some, some information about the, the degree and nature of the, of the problems that the business community has encountered since, since last March. It's been a, it's, the word unprecedented has been, has been used quite often in the last uh, 12 or 13 months, so I'll try to avoid it but um but it's the, the the situation that businesses have found themselves in has been um very different let's put it that way to to, to previous crises um the the one that many of us will remember most is the uh, the financial crisis of, of of 10 or 12 years ago um which of course uh would led to a um a massive reduction in spending and and consumption which which hit businesses hard um, we've had that this time, but it's been uh, a double whammy because we've also had massive constraints to production. Businesses haven't been able to do what they normally do in the, in the same way. Um, as you said, Sam, we're all probably sitting at home and able to uh, get on with our work to a large degree in, in EU public affairs or, or uh, related roles um, relatively easily. But there are many other sectors where, where just turning on your laptop in, 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 in your bedroom is not an option. And a lot of businesses have been have had real difficulties in adapting to the uh, to the confinement measures, and in some cases have simply had to shut up shop for for a matter of weeks, or in in, in some cases 
months, which is, of course, um, a very difficult situation because many um, fixed costs continue to come in um, and businesses have, have to find a way to, to, to cover them. There have been many measures taken to help them, either at EU level or at national level, and we, we've been very impressed with the way that the Commission reacted a little bit slowly perhaps to begin with, but they got their act together quickly and, and pushed out various initiatives such as the short-term employment sure initiative and, and by the um, the EIB they 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 um, helped to to enable financial intermediaries to provide um, support to businesses that have been difficult having difficulties. Our annual economic survey we've been doing it for a quarter of a century now but our last one was um, an all-time low in many respects. The idea of this survey is to gauge the mood within the business community for the next 12 months in relation to to various indicators including investment, employment, domestic sales, export sales and all of those um, indicators were, were, were at pretty much an all-time low as you might imagine in, in at the turn of last year and, and this year. So that really underlined the problems that we're, we're going through and, and there's been plenty of other data that, that backs that up um, and, and I don't want to to, to go into that too much. But just to, to reiterate, this is really a very, very challenging situation for a lot of businesses, particularly the smaller businesses that Chambers of Commerce um, represent most uh, mostly. Um, we have a few uh, recommendations that we, we would make. Uh, well, firstly, on, on the, the main topic to, today of, the, of the, um, the green pass, the digital green pass, um, we, we don't really have a firm position on that, to, to be frank, um, our, our view is that anything that will help get the economy going again is, is to be welcomed. As Elena said, uh, fundamentally, that means mass vaccination. Um, that's that's priority number one for us. Um, uh, and, it, and it's not happening quickly enough across much of the, the EU. So that's a, a cause for concern and is, of course, slowing down the, the, the recovery from, from this crisis. Um, and one of the big problems for us that we would underline is that the single market has has taken a battering over the last year or so. There's been a lot of um, previously um, um, sidelined barriers that have recur uh, re reappeared um, because of COVID, in many cases, understandably. But the, the problem for many businesses that we've, we've heard is that they simply don't know from one day to the next what they have to, to deal with whether that's a matter of getting products from one country to another or moving staff from, from one country to another. The rules have changed very frequently. Um, it improved a little bit um, after the first few months and we, we lobbied hard and, and, and pushed the commission to, to make progress on this and they did respond um, and they managed to secure a council recommendation um, to avoid um, uh, to, to try and um, coordinate temporary restrictions on non-essential travel within the EU, which had some positive impact, but nonetheless, there still remains a lack of certainty among businesses about what they can and can't do and where they and their goods and services can or cannot be, um, be sent or provided. Um, so that needs to be, to be tackled. A, a, a plus side of that is that it's underlined how important the single market is. I think sometimes um, that has become... Uh, taken for granted perhaps by, by a number of Europeans. We forget um, what things used to be like and how difficult it used to be to, to, to move around the European Union. Um, and I think this has really underlined um, that, that, that it is such an important aspect, not just in the economy, but in the, the way that Europeans live and the way that we operate. But from an economic perspective, it's, it's clearly underlined that the single market is a crucial component in, in Europe's um, prosperity. And it really underscored how much our value chains um, are no longer on a national level, but on a pan-European level. Um, as the second point I, I would underline, and I already touched upon it, is the need for certainty and planning if we're going to uh, if we're going to get a way out of the the, the pandemic. Um, businesses need to know they need a roadmap. They need to know where things are going to stand in a month's time, in three months' time, in six months' time, so that they can start um, planning their their own. Um, adaptation process and their own recovery process and contribute to the broader economic um, revival. Uh, my third point is about money. Um, financial liquidity, as I mentioned, was a big problem early in the, in the first lockdown and has continued to be a problem. And 
a lot of businesses are going to be carrying a burden um, for, for many months or years to come um, because of the, the debt they have incurred um, during, the, during the pandemic. And that's, um, that's um, exacerbated by, by the amount of savings that, is, that, is, that we've seen um, in, in recent months. Consumers are being cautious, are being guarded, and they are saving money rather than spending it. So we need to try and uh, trigger um, consumers to start spending money again one way or another. The EU stimulus plan will help to an extent, um, and it's a very ambitious package, but fundamentally we need to get um, the private sector um, spending and, and uh, consuming as, as well. Um, and my final point, Sam, before I conclude is, is um, a, a possibly a, a, a slightly broader one about the EU policy process and EU policy priorities. The, the, the challenges don't go away that, that were there before COVID came, um, occurred. Uh, we still need to tackle climate change. Um, we still need to um, deal with the digital transition. Um, and there are many other priorities that were outlined in von der Leyen's um, proposals uh, to, to the European Parliament at the beginning of her term and at the beginning of this commission. And they are still um, as valid as they were in, in mid-2019. But we need to remember that um, when they are pursuing those priorities, it needs to be done in a way that is very carefully calibrated to the difficult situation in which our businesses find themselves. This isn't me ranting about regulation. This isn't a deregulatory point I'm making here, but it's the message is, is one that we, we, we often make that any new proposal from the EU needs to be very carefully assessed, measured, the costs and benefits considered, um, particularly for smaller businesses, um, and that can't be that can't be overlooked now. And in fact, it's more important than ever. Than ever. Otherwise, the efforts of small businesses to get out of this crisis and help to contribute to the recovery will be will be undermined by by um, possible um, un, possibly avoidable burdens um, and disproportionate burdens that are that are going to to make their their activities harder to to, to deliver. So there's a lot to, to digest there, um, but there's a lot of factors that will that need to be considered beyond just um, the, the the vaccination program if we're going to get out of this crisis um, sooner rather than later. Thanks for that, Ben. Um, just wanted to sort of stick to the the point you made about um, vaccine passports as well. You know, uh, Eurosham doesn't have a joint position on this, as you said, but is that have, does that have the potential to give you the certainty in which businesses can thrive? Is it something that if the commission gets it right, I mean, there's still a lot of kinks to be ironed out because obviously the, the council doesn't have a, a joint position on this either. They don't really have a joint position on anything at the moment. If we look at the EU health minister summit yesterday where with the AstraZeneca issue, uh, there's still no uh, joint approach there. Um, but if done right, is something like a digital passport, a green pass, a certificate, something that your members could get behind? Um, is it something that some of your members were already um, pushing for? I mean, obviously, when it's linked to tourism, this is something that we all know is really, really important. Um, yeah, so, that, you know, in, in the perfect world, what would one of these sort of uh, initiatives look like to, to your, you know, from your point of view? Well, I, th I think anything that 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 is going to enable people to, to to travel again is is welcome. Whether that's through the uh, digital green certificate or simply by ensuring that the the majority, if not the entire population, um, <clears throat> is is vaccinated. Um, we we it, tourism is a, a sector that's particularly uh, and and I think uh, most obviously affected by this, but many others are too. Um, but if, you know, if 5% of the population have a digital green certificate and can go on holiday and, and travel around on business um, for business reasons, then that's not going to make the same difference as if 95% of people are vaccinated and, and, and we have um, consequently a much higher level of immunity. So I think for us, it's um, we, as business organisations, we're not really um, technically able to comment on what the what the ideal solution is, but the the objective is that that we that we get the economy moving and we get the population traveling again. Yeah. Elena, just turning to you now. You you uh, touched briefly in your opening statement about the challenges behind even designing something like a, a green pass. 
um, and the amount of time that vaccine passports have already been worked on, a number of years even, and of course, lockdown started more than 13 months ago. Um, if we we're optimistic about the state of the world at the moment, vaccination rates are increasing, um, governments are starting to get their act together. Um, by the time the European Commission or the EU institutions even get a green pass designed correctly, um, could we even say that we wouldn't need it anymore? Is, is this something that we don't even need to really even talk about, that it's something that by the time we've designed it, it's irrelevant? Or is there a role for this if it's done correctly? Well, thanks for the question. First of all, to say there are different, what has been worked on for many years is the interoperability aspect of vaccination certificates, not of substituting citizen, European citizenship on the basis of being a citizen of a European country by a biological characteristic or trait of being immune to a disease. Or, you know, this is very technical, we will need a jurist for that. But it's redefining, you know, free movement. Free movement is, is um, pretty clearly uh, established uh, and it has to do with citizenship, not with immunization status or immunity status. So um, I wouldn't be so concerned for the interoperability aspects. I would be concerned for the capacity of member states to implement, you know, um, all member states to implement um, sound controls on, on data handling and privacy of data and safeguarding these aspects. Um, there is uh, one, one trouble with scientists is they don't write for policymakers or lay audiences very often. We already have in the last two or three months um, a few papers which are looking at the rate at which we should be relaxing measures. And if you look at them, if you do it too quickly, to put it simply, and in terms of your vaccination rate, you're risking having variants exploding uh, across, across the area in which you have relaxed uh, um, um, the previous limitations. Um, it, it would be, I mean, people, people's health is not only, of course, COVID related, we have seen other restrictions. People also travel for health reasons. People travel to be united with families. There are mental health issues to consider. So I think with Ben, we are perfectly aligned and, and this is assessing, you need to assess all of these aspects. Um, you need to assess the impact um, for workers. You need to assess the impact for families, you need to assess the medical impact, the legal impact, the ethical impact. Um, also something which I'm not quite sure if it's it's clear enough. Um, we don't live in a European bubble in, in the sense this is a globalized world. So if you tackle the issue and in, in a, if you like lockdown area and you, you uh, open your, your frontiers and you open your borders and the rest of the world is unvaccinated, you will sooner or later end up in a similar situation. Um, so is this a solution? Uh, I would argue that, again, the biggest, the fastest solution we would have is accelerate the, the rate of vaccinations comprehensively. But I would emphasize the point of no matter what solution is proposed or implemented, it cannot be without a full impact assessment. It cannot be without stakeholder discussion and stakeholders of DG Connect are quite different from stakeholders of DG Health and DG Research, why not? And we do have experts for immunity duration and on vaccines at the AMA. And we do have experts at surveillance and at CDC, and they should all come together. Of course, the, this proposal uh, has been worked on with members of the Health Security Committee and, and many bodies. But again, if you look at it, um, it doesn't say that it's a proposal to, to speed up, if you like, economic development. It's not quite a roadmap to go back to, to normality. It's more of a quasi, if you like, solution to have something in place so that we facilitate some movement of the people which have been vaccinated or have had COVID. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit strange, if you like, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you both mentioned how, you know, the end game for basically, I guess, every European government right now is complete vaccination of their populations for those who, who can have the vaccine. Um, is there an argument that if a green pass, vaccine passport, is properly designed and offered to people. It acts as an incentive then for people to who maybe would not accept the vaccine. And if they're told that, you know, there is this option now where your travel rights, your freedom of movement is guaranteed by this new interoperable scheme, um, would that have a positive effect on vaccine rates? Would it have no effect? Um, would it even cause people to rebel against the idea of vaccination if they see some sort of 
threat? You know, is there a less a less sort of technical aspect to this? More of a um... well, we we can all answer that. This this is an issue of trust. We just mm -hmm discussing trust mm -hmm. and, and I think the public in all countries has been very trustful and, and has sort of been very compliant at the beginning of the pandemic and we have seen uh, you know trust being eroded in some quarters over time mm -hmm. because of uncertainty but because also you know for pharmacovigilance we've seen uh, different discussions on the different vaccines very intense people counseling appointments and so on anybody having um, worked in a community or being involved in public health and primary care will tell you about vaccination is a life cycle approach. So generating an incentive to get something going for six months is not necessarily a solution. Mm -hmm. I don't think a, a study has been done, but in any case, at, I mean, for COVID, I mean, for incentivization, but in any case, I, at this point, we are at the point where most people are not being offered to be vaccinated. Young people are not being offered to be vaccinated. So it is even, if you like, a potentially even an ethical solution uh, or question because, um, let us say that you have the right, as the proposal says, to, to such a pass, but you don't have the right to be vaccinated yet. What happens? Do you go to court and you, you say, I need my pass and please vaccinate me? Um, and then um, the, the provision in the regulation is discussing both paper vaccines, uh, certificates and, and passes and, um, and digital ones. The, the paper and the digital have different challenges. In terms of falsification, in terms of data security, as of combined data, we have seen Oracle and IBM across the states. You know, we have had the VIC, you know, vaccination identification certificate, similar, which is something uh, which companies may be using to work. So we we are at different risk because the Commission is generating this to facilitate coordination of measures across countries. But what happens if, for example, airlines say we need to see this before you travel, and then? I don't know, a theater or a supermarket says, we need to see this before you enter. So you cannot, once a technology is out there, you cannot exclude how it will be used. So as Ben said, you need to do an impact assessment and you need to consider all stakeholders and all aspects. Um, also, I think um, it's a little bit short-sighted to say that this is what I'm doing in these four countries, when already we have countries that are having bilaterals or even trilateral agreements outside with third countries in borders in terms of exchange of certificates. So we need to move a little bit faster in terms of what we're discussing for people moving across borders because for business or for pleasure uh, or for leisure, people move beyond, you know, even in Europe outside the EU, you know, Balkans, for example, you know, there are countries still with very limited access to vaccines. I'm Greek, uh, so we are a tourist country, but we have many neighbors which are not in the EU. So we have to also have an agreement for that. And we are a port of entry for many people entering Europe. So these considerations have to be thought out both from a public health perspective, from a business perspective, from economic perspective, and so on and so forth. And just turning to you now, Ben, uh, Elena rightly mentioned um, the data aspect of this and how, um, I mean, I, we've all had experiences with this over the last 12 months or so where with contact tracing apps, um, given our details over to businesses, to uh, contact tracers if needed. It does seem like in terms of giving your data over to um, authorities is something that's basically now part and parcel of being part of our pandemic world. I mean, from a business point of view, is this something that sort of prevents this economic recovery that we're striving for? This idea, you know, that even small businesses are now gonna have to know how to handle maybe sometimes lots of data um, I mean, we have GDPR to think about as well. I believe that there's not going to be an impact assessment for that. Correct me if I'm wrong for the regulation, Elena. Um, yeah, so Ben, I mean, this idea of, of, you know, businesses and data, is this something that's worrying to your members? Um, I think it's some way down the list of, of, of issues that businesses are concerned, concerned about at the moment. It's not really um, one that's been ad, um, addressed, but you're, you're, you're quite right that any kind of... Um, um, reporting or administrative procedure, um, albeit a very small one, can can cumulatively uh, cre create um, a lot of hassle for for small businesses. Uh, fr from my own perspective, as a the chief executive of, uh, of of Euro Chambers, we, for example, beginning of this month, we we got we were told one week in advance that we had to set up a. Um, <clears throat> a, a um, a registration process for anybody who has to come to the office so as, as we've been used to for for some months now we we must stay away from the office and work from home whenever possible but there are occasions when it's necessary 
to come to the office very rarely, but nonetheless, and now we have to um, provide reports on that to the authorities. We have to, um, at the beginning of each month, send a full list of, of, of staff via, uh, via um, uh, a, a, a digital interface. And then at the end of the month, provide a list of everybody who came to the office and they're gonna control that. Doesn't sound like a, <clears throat> um, um, a lot of work in itself, but, but nonetheless for, uh, for an even smaller um, secretariat, that might become um, just one thing on top of many others. Um, th th there are data issues around these digital green certificates. As far as I understand, the, the proposal says that it shouldn't require um, the creation of an EU level database and that the, um, the, the verification should be decentralized and, and interoperable. I've got no idea in, in practice how that would work, but it would seem to imply that it would feed into existing um, mechanisms and procedures that they have at national level for gathering um, su such, such data, uh, rel uh, comparable data. So in that sense, maybe it wouldn't be too, too burdensome. Um, but it's, I, I think it, it would probably be a small price to pay if it would, if it would really help with, with um, getting, getting things moving again. You mentioned before about how, um, you know, some of the times you've been impressed by how the EU, the Commission has reacted to the pandemic when it comes to shore, for example. Um, another example I immediately think about is the Green Lanes app, you know, getting freight moving across borders. Um, if you had to sort of sum up your experience of, you know, your members' experiences with the, the EU anyway, over the course of the last 12 months of the pandemic, um, would you say that it's more of frustration or more of, um, you know, the best has been done within the situation. It's completely unprecedented, is our word again. Um, or, or, you know, is it things are how they are? Or has there really been frustration, the lack of coordination? I mean, especially at the moment when it comes to things like vaccine protocols and, and this kind of thing. Yeah, I think, I think um, it's fluctuated. As I said, in the first few weeks, things were quite slow and there was um, um, some anger among businesses at the um, dramatic um, introduction of, of barriers at, at, at national borders. Um, and and that, that, that continued, let's think, probably into about May 2020, there were, there were problems there. And then they gradually began to tackle that. But at the same time, the, the SURE initiative that I mentioned <clears throat> was rolled out reasonably quickly and you know, incredibly quickly, actually, by European standards, because um, it's uh, it's um, it's a slow-moving machine. The, the the EU policy process, and they they managed to get that one out very quickly. And, and that wasn't the 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 only time that the, the decisions were taken um, in a much accelerated manner during this during this crisis. So crisis. So there's been um, um, so a lot of positive things. There was again the, the, uh, another dip was around the stimulus package because the proposal came out in. In July, and it took till early December, if I remember correctly, for it actually to be to be adopted. And now the recovery and resilience plans um, seem to be um, proceeding very slowly. Um, I don't know if every member state ultimately met the um, the deadline of end of March to submit their recovery and resilience plans, but now they're going to have to be assessed by the Commission. Um, so the actual money is is still months away, um, and there's been some frustration among chambers and I think other business organisations that they haven't really been consulted. In that process, so there's a fear that the that these huge amounts of money might not necessarily reach the uh, the economic actors who 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 really need it to help um, kickstart the economy. So that's a an, another area where there was a dip in in um, in in the mood and the the perception of of the of the EU. Um, and yeah, now I think uh, generally speaking, there's there's frustration about the the vaccination pro program. Brussels seems to be getting most of the blame for that, but I think it's um, far more. Um, complex the, the, than that. But overall, I, I would say that um, the EU, from a business perspective, has come out of this pretty well so far and has, has handled what is a, an incredibly difficult situation with their hands tied to a large extent because not having competence on, on some of the key issues that they've been dealing with, um, notably health, um, has, has constricted what they can do. But they've done a lot of what they could do in a reasonably swift manner. Mm -hmm. Elena, I think you mentioned earlier, or even before the event, about how um, implementation uh, in this issue is going to be a primary challenge, shall we say, or, or hurdle. Can you tell us a bit more about that, the, the real like sort of 
the nitty gritty sort of challenges here of actually doing something like this because it, it isn't something that's even been done before. Uh, I, will, I can try. I think already Ben mentioned he's not quite sure. He said, I'm not quite sure what this is or how this will work. Mm. So indeed, there's some fuzziness there. I mean, in every proposal, in, in every suggestion at EU wide level, the challenge is what you implement locally and whether it's really feasible and how it spans out, you know, and, and how it pans out and what outcomes you get. So I think. For me, what was strange, and I'm hoping to discuss a little bit more with, uh, with the DGs, is that indeed they're not proposing to generate a central database for the data, uh, but to have a gateway for the people or the entities, for the entities issuing um, the, the passes, which could be a clinic or a hospital, you know, in a member state. Uh, potentially with, with different software for digitally um, signing off certificates and so on. At the same time, there's since the 25th of March under consultation, um, amendment on the passenger locator forms for which there is a gateway with the CDC. So I'm not sure how the couple of these data will work out. Um, and I'm a little bit concerned because of course, if you combine passenger locator forms with uh, data that you have on vaccination, you know, with potentially other data, you know, that could be out there harvested, then you start seeing other, other, you know, uh, security issues, uh, not safety, and many GDPR issues. Um, a major concern for the implementation, I'm, I'm probably, you have all thought about it, but it's not the most prevalent or prominent thought uh, you have, is if, I'm, if I have a green pass, uh, do I need to get a test before I travel to a country? And that is also, um, uh, if you like, a very scary prospect because if somebody is vaccinated and you know we, we do it away with testing, um, which I think we're already seeing in some cases. You know, we're also seeing self-testing, rapid antigen testing, test tests of different uh, sensitivity and specificity. So tests that not for sure tell you whether you are uh, likely to infect other people or to get ill yourself. So we see wider usage for them. And there is a pretty good reason for that. They, they can serve a need, they can meet a need. But in implementation, if you're going to implement this certificate, you need a very good roadmap, a very good strategy in what you're going to do in terms of testing. And you need to have in parallel comparative effectiveness research telling you how many people went through the holes, if you like, and potentially were um, you know, not tested, had a pass and you know, infected somebody or got ill themselves. And and, you know how early you got that so the provision for that is not quite there um on the other points that that ben touched for implementation and feasibility we haven't seen a harmonized strategy across the eu for example for frontline workers for cross-border workers which there were proposals by the commission but somehow they didn't quite made it to implementation across the eu so i think that is also something to discuss i know we are in the middle or amidst the pandemic but this is, this is global health security and, and policy, and we should have been discussing it. There should have been something in place. Uh, it is a single market for free movement of people and, and goods, and you know it, you, you cannot anticipate a crisis to solve it. So I, I would hope to see at least the beginning of a more comprehensive dialogue on if you have a new technology, if you have such a threat, what do we do? How do we communicate? Which bodies come on board? Uh, which stakeholders? So for example, with Ben, I think, um, public health and, and small business, we don't come together, maybe, maybe in a cosmic event, we don't come together that often. We should, it's a cross-sectoral issue. You cannot discuss public health without discussing traffic, movement, um, commerce, yeah? because also people, we're suffering from inequalities. Imagine being healthy, but having zero income. <laughs> So we, we have to look more broadly at things. And in terms of what the Commission has done, I mean, the Commission is doing many things, but for public health, technically, we have some limitations at uh, TFEU, at uh, TFEU. Um, and I think um, this is not palpable. I mean, I get people, maybe also you two saying, why doesn't the Commission do something more? Um, but it's tricky. Uh, and, you know, to avoid Article 168, you know, the, the, the proposal appears to be adopting a sort of unidisciplinary technical perspective, so to avoid public health issues and stick into interoperability. But this, this is a limitation we have in terms of, of governance and, and legislative basis. Um, so that should be addressed. Uh, it's, it's bound to happen again, if you like. So that's, that's our perspective. Thanks. And turning to you, Ben, the, the, the point Elena just made about how, um, you know, the public health sphere and commerce and anybody else you want to name should be talking to each other more and more about these kind of things so that solutions can be implemented and worked out more effectively. 
Um, do you think that's maybe going to be a silver lining of the pandemic in a way that, you know, different sectors are going to be talking to each other more often, more honestly, maybe not through Zoom, maybe over a coffee when, you know, you can have a proper chat with someone. Is that, do you get the sense of that, that people are going to talk to each other more or, or you know, we'll just go back into our, our little silos once we've had our vaccines? Or... I don't know, really. It's it's very hard to to, to gauge that. I would, I would hope so. Um, that I think there's that there has to be a multi-stakeholder approach to, to, to these things. The Commission um, often tries to, to engage with a variety of stakeholders, but sometimes you get the impression that they're doing that more um, through a politeness and, and, and um, the external image than, than, than any kind of substantive um, discussion. The number of expert groups we've sat on that, um, that have, have, you know, the conclusions have, have, have led to, 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 have had little or no traction or impact on the on the outcome uh, I, I wouldn't dare, care to number but uh, so so yeah let's hope that there there is an improvement in that respect um, and you know we're we're certainly as chambers of commerce willing to do so as you as you can imagine chambers uh, not just euro chambers is the kind of umbrella organization but there are nearly 2,000 chambers around europe and 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 they're very closely interlinked with their local communities so i'm pretty sure that those kind of dialogues do go on um, quite quite often anyway, but maybe there there is room for improvement, and and let's hope that that you and Elena are right that this proves to be uh, one of the silver linings from from, from this. But to try and be positive through these times, isn't it? That's one of the uh, good mental health tricks. Um, I mean, your point, Elena, about how um, the Commission doesn't have a lot of competences or any in health, and how you know making sure that this is all about interoperability means that it does keep a lot of say over. The issue it, it puts me in mind of how um, you know Joe Biden is labeling everything as budget so that everything can be done more easily without the help of the Republicans. Blah, blah, blah. Um, do you think that maybe again, if we think about a silver lining to all of this, is that the there will be an honest conversation about giving the Commission, giving the EU more competence to deal with these kind of things by itself, rather than waiting for? you know, a consensus that may never happen between council members or all this kind of thing, or is that even needed in your opinion? Yes, it, well, it, it is not necessarily giving more competences. It's, it's I, I would say that there's three things to consider. The first is what you already have. We have a lot of expert groups. We have a, a group, which not a lot of people perhaps know, which is a group on ethics for, for um, science of new technologies and so on. I don't think they have provided, they have provided an opinion uh, for solidarity and for COVID and so on, but not on this topic. So there is an expert group there. Um, it's convened with specific mandates, which, you know, you can expand. We have another group for investment, you know, in, in healthcare. So we, we have expert groups. We also have a lot of um, very able people and we have the ability to cross talk at fora. So the commission has people and expertise that can be pulled together. Uh, in in big company in a big country in federal even country in in Europe when you have many divisions and many departments you always end up not cross talking mm -hmm. so I think perhaps there can be improvement there as can be improvement by us as scientists which we have to monitor a little bit more what happens in policy uh, normally we you where we sort of we shun uh, this very controversial things get very political so we want to avoid that but in a public health, you have to sort of position yourself and provide input. But for scientists, this is not a natural remit, if you like. We're not very comfortable doing that. And then in terms of governance, I mean, there, there are different uh, aspects. Um, the commission has had many years ago, a um, global health plan in place, it needs to be updated. So, and also global health security has been discussed. Should there be a unified policy? Well, there should at least be discussion which is updated and you know, up speed and so on. So yes, I'm hoping it will happen. I'm hoping um, media will contribute, um, a Eurosham or you know, stakeholders will contribute, experts will contribute, but uh, we are also having to see a positive thing. We have seen suddenly everybody having access digitally to, to dialogue. If you speak English, of course, which is not the case for everybody in Europe, not every citizen, but at least people can access and see what is happening should they seek it. So for me, that's an improvement. That was not the case um, before the pandemic, if you like. So the closer you were to Brussels, the easier it was to discuss. I think this is starting to change and it's a good beginning. So. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, if I can, if I yes, can come in there, it'd um, be interesting to see what impact the the last 12 months has on the future of Europe debate that's going to start um, in, in, in a month or so. Um, they tried it under the Juncker Commission and, and it, it, it didn't really get far, um, but, uh, but issues like uh, competence on, on health could, could be the kind of topics that, that could come up in the context of the conference on the future of Europe. It's certainly something that we'll be trying to contribute to um, and, and, um, and, and engage in, but um, I, I'm just thinking out loud about whether it will be a more effective exercise this time around because of what we've all been through over the last year or so. Let's mm -hmm. hope so. Health is for certainly one of those, you know, issues that I think really not triggers people, but people that obviously have a vested interest in. And I think we see that as well with climate issues where these are being increasingly linked to people's health, like air pollution, and it does pay off in that people feel more engaged in that way. Um, and we just turn to the Q&A section for a minute. We have a, a question from Victor. Hello, Victor. Thank you for tuning in. I think this one will be for you, Elena, because it's, it's more into the nitty gritty of the, the digital green certificate proposal. Uh, Victor is asking, basically, what's is it going to apply to tourists from outside of the EU? Um, can it? What should happen if a tourist comes from a third country and was vaccinated with a vaccine that isn't approved by the EMA? Uh, I guess Sputnik and Sinopharm, for example. I mean, what does what does the proposal say at the moment? Are those are those tourists excluded, or, or is this just for EU citizens? Or so I can see in reverse. I mean, the the, the last point is what if the tourist was vaccinated with the Pfizer? So the Pfizer is is approved uh, by the EU, but of course this is a valid issue, particularly as there are countries which are in the EU and are vaccinating with non EMA approved vaccines. Mm -hmm. We have that already. It is gray zone, gray area, I would assume, but exactly because the competence is with member states, if a member state chooses to have a bilateral agreement uh, with a country which has such thing, then it will become an issue of arrangement as we had last year with uh, the passenger locator forms and the gateways being created, you know, airway corridors and so on. It will be a question of what agreements are made between these two countries and between the rest of the member states. That's why I said in the beginning that exactly for this kind of thing and exactly to, to um, some, um, sorry, to um, um, Ben's point, you need to have a very comprehensive, uh, not only scenarios, very comprehensive map which doesn't only discuss how you're gonna exchange uh, information and how you're gonna map passes within the EU. When you have, you know, we are not living in a bubble. It's, we are not an island. So we have many non-EU countries which are vaccinated, any EU countries which are vaccinated with non-EMA approved vaccines. Mm -hmm. And I mean, then you go into the basis of discrimination because in, if in some cases, countries have had to speed up vaccination, utilize, non-EMA approved vaccines and non-EMA, I mean, the EMA, to be clear, because I also get that asked a lot, uh, the EMA doesn't choose and say, I will approve this, but I mean, the, the, the sponsor has to go in and seek approval. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, so this has to be clear because like, we get many questions like, why don't they bring this medicine or this drug? And you know, why don't we have this? Um, so I'm hoping, and that's why I mentioned that the EMA should be there to advise on what should be acceptable and what should be not. And again, we should have an EU wide policy. Mm -hmm. um, also, because um, there are many issues uh, related to this, which have to do with minority groups, which have to do with potential uh, migrants, refugees, migrant workers entering even from non-EU countries. It could be as workers, it could be with different status. Uh, we have that uh, in Germany, we have that in Greece. Uh, so they should be clear where we stand with this. And um, again, I think I'm hoping that we can comment on the proposal and we can see uh, some of these aspects tackled uh, legislatively. So, yeah. Mm. This is probably the final question as we're rapidly running out of time, unfortunately. Um, you mentioned, Elena, about how DG Connect is the one that's you know in, in the lead on this rather than DJ Sante. Um, when it comes to the EMA, the ECDC, how closely involved are they in, in this proposal? Are they being consulted as experts? Or is, there, is their expertise going to waste in, to an extent? Or in... I'm, I'm going on the basis of what I have read. I have read the, mm -hmm. it's a long proposal. So as I said, we will release a formal detailed statement. The ECDC is mentioned as expertise being consulted, not as driver in this. The ECDC is mentioned explicitly in the past locator forms. Um, it is natural, I would say, I'm not surprised that DG Connect is running this 
because going back many years, the interoperability aspect was the biggest challenge, including for electronic health records, for the cross-border healthcare directive, for those of you that are familiar with these concepts and for caring for people. Um, but I do think that we have very different stakeholders, not all, all which are very active in DigiConnect. So um, I didn't see a mention of the EMA advising on this, and I didn't see a particular effort to scope for different types of immunity status. But then again, if you start giving different immunity stages on the basis of very early emerging information, you will be discriminating. Um, I mean, if we know that in immunosuppressed with one dose or even with two doses, you have different duration, you start, you start to either risk or compromise if you change the duration of the certificate mm -hmm. or pass. So yes, these are, these are you know, it would be good to have seen an impact assessment, which the proposal states that is not there for lack of time, but I would say that an initial assessment, impact assessment would not take that long and I'm hoping that they will do it. So again, this is on the basis of what I have read, what is mm -hmm. in black and white. Um, I'm also hoping that in the past year locator form, and I will say it one more time because it's open to consultation, that comments in that consultation will be taken on board because some of us are commenting on the two, I mean, UFA will be commenting on this combined. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Elena. And thank you, Ben. Thank you to both of you for um, you know, joining us for this. I think it's been, uh, like we said before, it's such a broad topic and uh, inevitably with webinars, you just don't have enough time to get into it in the detail that you want. But I think that we've made some you know, um, good points and maybe raise some real issues that we have to make sure are really put to the forefront and that's discrimination, um, freedom of movement, um, just basically the right to vaccines and also then travel. That's the thing that people I think don't um, realize it's not about just downloading a piece of paper and then getting on a plane. There are a lot of moving parts here, um, a very complex machinery. Um, to everyone watching at home, I hope that you've learned something from this webinar, I certainly have. Um, it's obviously far more complex than I think uh, most of me, I, more complex than I realized for sure. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how this develops over the next few weeks, few months or so. Um, that's it from me. I'm going to hand back to my colleague, Andre Constantin now, who's going to uh, sum up the event and uh, ELF for us. And until next time, bye. Hi, Sam. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, a big, big thank you uh, on behalf of the European Liberal Forum to, uh, to Elena, Ben and to Sam for joining us this afternoon to talk about this, this very topical issue, which in one way or another will, uh, will surely affect uh, all of our lives in the months to come and possibly maybe in the years to come. And uh, with that in mind, we, we really hope that uh, as Europeans we'll be able to pull together and work together to create to create the best possible uh, certificate and to create the best possible mechanism to actually be able to, to utilize the positive effects of the vaccination programs in all the EU countries, and not just the EU countries, of, of the vaccination programs in the entire world, in order to be able to, to allow citizens and people to go back to their normal lives before the pandemic, to allow businesses to reopen, uh, trade to resume, and for all of us to try to, to get back to a bit of what resembled normal life before 2019. Thank you so, so much for, for joining us. Uh, two more things before I let you go, and I don't want to, to keep you too much. Stay tuned for another On the Agenda uh, in two weeks' time, same place, uh, same, same uh, medium via Zoom. It's going to be on uh, 22nd of April. So say, stay tuned for more info on that. We're going to look at another topic that's going to be on the European agenda or strategically left off the European agenda for one reason or another. But until then, I do want to have, uh, I do want to invite you to check the European Liberal Forum for our upcoming flagship event, the Idea Accelerator which will take place on Friday, 16th of April. Uh, I'm going to post right now in the chat a link to the event page. Uh, we're looking at how the future is digital. We're gonna look at AI, we're gonna look at e-governance, we're gonna look at the European liberal, uh, European uh, internet. We're gonna look at on social media. Uh, so please check it out. You can register for one, two, or all of the sessions, the more the merrier. And we hope to see all of you there next week. And then the week after that, at another on the agenda. So until then, 
thank you again for everything. Stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.